Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the CE Sustainable Finance Summit 2023. And as many of you probably already know, the second day is focused on banking. And if you look at the partners of this year's summit, you will notice there's actually quite a few banks, and which I think is understandable given the, the importance of banks um, in the transition to more sustainable economy, especially given, given this region as well. And um, we actually have a very packed agenda focused on sustainability in banking, what it means exactly, what is the role of banks, and how they can support companies and the region on the, in the transition. So I'm actually really excited for this day, personally, as well, as someone who really believe in the role and the position of banks in these topics, but also because of all the, all the amazing and inspirational speakers we will hear, hear from today. And the agenda is actually so packed that uh, maybe without any further ado, we can already move to the, the first keynote of the day to open the discussions and open this topic of sustainability in banking. So if I can very kindly, Munir, ask you to come to the stage. So we will start with a keynote by Munir Nanji, who's the, who's the managing director of Central Europe, and it's Central Europe head, and Ireland cluster head, and country officer for Citibank here in Prague. Great. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, Dobe Rana, good morning. Thank you, moderator. Um, I'm actually very delighted to be here today, uh, to be asked to be the panelist speaker and to be hosting uh, the opening keynote speech for the Banking Day. So before I start, a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I know a lot of you are going to spend the whole week here, uh, and you probably be very sort of in tune with sustainability. My job really means I am a very much a practitioner. And so what I thought I would do today is really talk a little bit more about, you know, as a practitioner, how I work with the environment uh, in, in obviously in Central Europe. Um, this week is going to be exciting. We've got uh, two of Citibank speakers. So we have Wild Smith, who's Citi's Chief Sustainability Officer globally, will be talking during the week. Uh, we have Catherine Mintoff, uh, who's in the back there. Uh, she's uh, EMEA's Chief Sustainability Officer. She'll be on a panel. So they are the experts, and they'll speak a lot about what Citi is doing on sustainability and what our goals and commitments are. What I would like to do is, uh, in the time I have, really touch upon some of the key hot topics that are out there in the news. And the reason I want to touch on these hot topics is because I firmly believe that the financial world is very interwoven when we talk about sustainability. And I think if you're aware about what's out there in the macro environment, it helps us reflect back into what's taking place within our sustainable you know, experiences. I'll then talk a little bit about you know, why we're in Central Europe, you know, the opportunities here, which is very exciting. And then I'll talk about the path the CE is taking towards sustainability. And then finally finish off with the city framework on sustainability. So hopefully we have a, a good conversation. I'm not going to use any slides. And if you need some coffee, I encourage you to have some coffee as well. Yeah? So let's start off with uh, the four hot topics that are out there. The first one, uh, which you probably have read in the newspaper today, uh, is the US debt ceiling. Very topical. And uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a political gridlock right now. Uh, and I think it's going to take a lot of brickmanship to get out of the situation we are in. So the clock is ticking, as Janet Yellen has put it as well in the paper today, is June 1st is the X date, uh, where the US has to decide on the increase of the debt ceiling or not. And in the past, the US has been in the situation. So 2011, 2013, very much in the same situation. However, the US has never defaulted on the debt. But in 2011, S&P downgraded the US. So you know, we did some analysis, and we went back to 2011 and said, what happened then? So when that happened you know, over 10 years ago, you realize the equity market resulted in a lot of volatility. The US dollar weakened, and there was a lot of unrest. So we are in a, in a moment of time where we're sitting at that sort of pinnacle time. And why is it important for us? Well, the US economy the US dollar is very well interwoven within what we do financially. Commodities are traded in US dollars, reserves are in US dollars, exchange rates are in US dollars, and so on and so forth. But for Europe, it's quite significant because the US is the largest trading partner for Europe. So in the event 
that the U.S. cannot pay its bills. European companies that are dealing with the U.S. will have to find a way to get their source of funds. So it has ramifications downstream. Uh, and if you look at some industries, they're heavily reliant on the U.S. being the biggest market. So this is an important one out there. Uh, it's important for us to watch and see. And hopefully we come to some agreement. Uh, but as you can see from what we're seeing, you know, US, the U.S. government's funding rates have gone up uh, over the past couple of days. The next hot topic I want to touch upon is uh, the recent bank failures, which is close to heart. I think it's the banking day today, so you can't run away from not talking about it. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about, is there a contagion effect between what happened in the U.S.? Will it spread to Europe? Now, there are a couple of things to put in mind. One is the concentration in Europe is not as significant as it is in the U.S. If you look at banks like Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, uh, Signature Bank, uh, and you look at what happened to them, they're very isolated examples. In Europe, the regulations are fairly strong. So, for example, the interest rate risk uh, on the banking book means that all banks have to hedge the interest rate risk. It's very different to what happens in the U.S. If you look at liquidity ratios and capital ratios, the regulators in Europe have very high requirements. So liquidity coverage ratios in Europe are higher than that they are in the U.S. If you look at FFCR, higher than, US, than Europe than in U.S. So our ratios are higher, liquidity is stronger, strong capital buffers, so we are in a better position. Now, having said that, uh, you know, one should be aware about where we are coming from. So Europe has been in a negative interest rate zone, with euro rates being subdued. They've obviously started increasing in the recent past. But when the rates were low, what happens is financial investors, institutions are looking for yield. So what does yield mean? You take more risk. So is there more risk out there today? And I think this is what I would say is a black swan out there within the European banking sector. The other one which is um, evident is the rise of fintech. If you look at Europe, there's been some amazing banks who've accessed and gone into the fintech space. And it's created a difference between traditional banks and the fintech banks. So can traditional banks now compete with the banks that are in the fintech space? And I think this is one, one area that I think European banks need to think around their competitive uh, dimension and landscape. The third big issue, hot topic out there, uh, is one that's probably close to all our hearts, is you know, buildings and homes we live in. So we all love real estate, we live in homes, we buy homes, we want to buy homes, etc. There's been a lot of talk in the markets around, is there a real estate bubble and so forth. So let's try and demystify a bit about that. So if you look at the global financial crisis in 28, 29, the large banks in the US had a lot of the mortgage-backed securities. Today, in 2023, there are over 4,000 regional banks in the US that have taken over these assets. So they're spread around the, the domestic market in the US. In Europe, the systemic issue does not exist. The reason why European banks, roughly 15 to 17 percent of their real estate portfolio sits on the balance sheets. In the US, it's over 40 percent. So there's a very big difference there. The other thing is the way the books are funded. In Europe, institutional investors, so be it you know, the hedge funds, the asset managers, the pension funds, they fund the pension, so the, the mortgage book, unlike the US. So it's quite a diversified portfolio. And also in Europe, a lot of the debt securities are hedged. So the risk is limited. But, I use the word but, the thing to note is the divergence of prices. So we've come out of COVID, and what we're seeing is that real estate prices in the rural areas versus the urban areas, there's a disparity. So it's creating a bit of an inflection in that market. And the other thing to think to keep in mind is the commercial real estate. So as we move towards green and we move towards more sustainable buildings, European companies that have infrastructure that doesn't meet those standards will have to pay a lot more to become more sustainable when it comes to real estate from a commercial standpoint. So these are the, these are the concerns out there within the European, European kind of real estate market. The last hot topic I want to talk about, and I think I'm glad it's a banking day as well because my banker friends in the room will relate to, is a, a term that we've heard about a lot when we look at our capital models, is the weighted average cost of capital, known as WAC. Why do I talk about this? So we issued a paper in the bank towards end of last year. It was quite eye-opening. So weighted average cost of capital within 
uh, within the world has gone up by four, is, is, sorry, has hit the 40-year high. And in Europe itself, year on year, WAC is up by 150 basis points. And the reason is because you've got increased interest rates, we have credit tightening, and this is, you know, besides us talking about inflation, recession, talking about, you know, what's going to happen to the headwinds I mentioned, so cost of capital has really gone up. This is a concern because if you're a company that is highly leveraged and rates are where they are, you're basically servicing debt. So it's quite a risky proposition. And if rates continue to rise, that brings more risk in the environment. The other interesting fact is that this is not across high yield or even companies that are AA rated. This is across all, invest all grades of companies and all sectors. And return on invested capital in Europe for about 30% of the companies is lower than weighted average cost of capital. And you can see this in the, in the, in the, in the public markets. If you look at the M&A activity, it's pretty subdued. And one of the reasons for that, we believe, is because investors aren't looking for growth. They're looking for value. And if your weighted average cost of capital is more than your return on invested capital, you're pretty much servicing debt. You're not really investing in the future. So I think this is a concern that I think bankers should have, obviously, in terms of stress testing your portfolio and keeping a view of how this is going to be uh, you know, played out. Advice we give our clients is really look at capital ratios, liquidity ratios of your, of your customers, make sure they have liquidity, focus on derivatives to hedge your interest rate risk, and importantly, on a strategy basis, make sure you prioritize you know, how companies are investing. Focus on the key strategies and things that can be pushed out later, it's worth doing, because cost of capital is on the rise. So just to summarize, uh, I spoke about four key hot topics. We touched on the US debt ceiling, uh, we talked about the banking turmoil, we talked about real estate, and we talked about uh, capital and capital adequacy. Uh, switching gears to a much more positive note now. I want to talk about uh, where we are in, in Central Europe. So if you, if, uh, personally, when I, when I think about Central Europe, I've been here for two years now, and I've been associated with the region for you know, many years in the past. As a bank and as obviously a person living in Prague, I love being here, and I'll tell you why. I think we are in an amazing part of history. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we are living in an environment where we have political stability, unlike many other parts of the world. We are living in a, in a cluster which is very close to markets that require our products and services, you know, next to Germany, Italy, France, etc. And we are located in a very good place. Our economies are growing, which is positive. We're getting FDI into our economies. And lastly, Central Europe has amazingly high quality of skilled manpower, which is very important. Now, you know, what does that mean for business? So firstly is, I think entrepreneurship is the future of where we go. Entrepreneurship creates the growth we want for future generations. So what's the proxy for that? So one proxy is venture capital. If you look at Central Europe just last year, $6 billion invested in venture capital. Doesn't sound like a big number, but it's 200% more than it was a couple of years ago. Whereas in Western Europe, it's been decreasing. If you look at startup, two billion of that has gone to startups, and startups are the future. So clearly there's money going into the place that we want it to go to. But let's look at some certain examples. So I was looking at some statistics, and I was trying to look at um, you know, the unicorns that Central Europe has created. So I'll name a couple. So unicorns are companies that are valued at a billion dollars or more. And we've created a fair share. So for example, Bolt, which is the Estonian e-commerce company, which we've all used. It comes from our region, does really well. In the Czech Republic, we've got Avast. In Poland, we've got Allegro. Uh, if you go down in the Czech Republic, you've got Kiwi.com, you've got Bitpanda, for example. And as you, as you go down that food chain, you realize all these companies that are in the unicorn space are into e-commerce, into cyber, into fintech, into logistics, which is really where things are moving towards. And you also got companies like um, UiPath, which was valued at one point at $30 billion. So clearly, we can see the unicorns, we can see the entrepreneurship drive. If you move a bit further and you say, okay, well, that's good. Tell us more about FDI, tell us about growth. So we spend a lot of time in the bank looking at industry segments. 
And one segment that excites us a lot is the mobility segment. And I don't use automotive, I use mobility. The reason is because if you look at the mobility ecosystem, it's quite fascinating. We, we talk about green, we talk about moving towards you know, electric vehicles and so forth, but if you look at the ecosystem, it's not just the car, it's the charging station, it's the battery, it's the advertising, it's the technology, it's the chips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a huge ecosystem. And I spent 12 years of my career in Asia, and I've seen how Asian companies have done. I was in Asia two weeks ago, I was blown away, where companies in Asia are talking about putting more money in this region. Why? Because you're closer to the biggest markets, you can service them better, and so forth. And as we have geopolitical tension in Asia, all the more better for us. Therefore, if you look at mobility in that spectrum, it does give us a lot of hope to where the cluster is going. And there's some good examples. So I'll take a company like um, Toyota. They put a billion dollars in Poland into hybrid technology. It's going to lift up uh, you know, the Polish market. If you look at Samsung, $2.2 billion in Slovakia into semiconductors. This is all recent stuff. And then we've got real examples of going concerns. In the Czech Republic, Liftago, which is a rental e-scooter company, Life. In Poland, we've got an electronic vehicle company called Telemobiliteka, which is running as well. So you've got real examples of companies that are in business here. So mobility is the future, and we are sitting in that future. The last thing I want to talk about when it comes to Central Europe is uh, the defense sector. Uh, I know it's a sensitive topic, but I think it's worth bringing up here. And the reason I bring this up here is because Central Europe historically has got amazing manufacturing, amazing relationships in the defense industry, and amazing manpower. And today with GDPs you know, going towards 14, sorry, 22% or more towards defense, the defense sector is seeing the boom. And there are some examples of it. So you know, if I look at Lockheed Martin, US company, they put in you know, close to 2,000 jobs in Poland. It's gonna lift up the defense sector. If I look at the Czech Republic, CSG Group made an acquisition of an Italian defense company called Finoshi. There are many examples. So you, you've got defense as a very good pinnacle for growth, and then obviously the reconstruction of Ukraine is going to create another uplift as well. So I think we are in a very good space, very excited to be in Central Europe, and I think it's good to have um, this sort of engines of growth uh, really at our doorstep. I'm going to switch gears now. I'm going to talk about sustainability. So, and it's, it is a sustainable event, so I can't, I can't not speak about it. So it's quite evident to us, you know, as we look at ESG profiles of companies, and I think, as you know, we would, as a bank, we do a lot of the advisory around ESG. We look at things like share price, we look at art performance, we look at valuation, uh, we look at volatility, and it's very clear that companies that have an ESG roadmap perform much better, and companies that don't are getting penalized. And it's clearly happening, and more so in Europe, because you know, we are much more in a much more advanced stage of embracing ESG in finance. Now, Central Europe, where are we? I think we've made significant progress in recent years, but we still have some room for improvement. And the reason I say this is because according to the 2020 uh, index sent out by um, the SDG index by United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, Central Europe countries, so Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, etc., ranked in the middle of the pack. So we've got some work to do. So I want to applaud uh, the conference organizers for you know, doing this event, because uh, there is a glass half full for us. However, there has been some outstanding examples of leadership and sustainability in the region. So for example, in Poland, there's been significant investments in renewable energy, and Poland is now the largest producer of wind energy in Europe. Fascinating. Hungary has implemented a successful carbon pricing system that has helped reduce emissions and incentivize cleaner energy sources. The Czech Republic has implemented policies to encourage use of EV vehicles, and we've clearly seen the rise in EV vehicles uh, in, the last, in the recent past. Um, if I go to Slovakia, it's made huge progress in terms of reducing waste and increasing recycling, and they have a goal to have 60% recycling by 2025. So this is all very positive. Let's look at specific companies. So if you look at, um, in the Czech Republic, there's a company called Pegas Nonwovens. It produces sustainable nonwoven fabrics that use for diapers and for other things. In Hungary, we've got a company called Gringo, which produces cleaner energy for cigarettes. 
it's, it's quite an oxymoron, cigarettes, clean energy. Uh, the Polish company PGE is transitioning towards clean energy, and its goal is very clearly to get carbon neutral by 2050. Hungary has a company called Pletio, and has developed a solar panel system that can be integrated to payments and public infrastructure. And lastly, in the Czech Republic, a company called Giva is developing a platform for energy trading for peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. So fascinating examples in Central Europe. So overall, great work done, but I think we're making progress in sustainability, and I think sustainability has to happen both at corporate levels and at national levels. Let's talk a bit about city uh, before we close. So what do we do at city in terms of how we view companies and how we measure sustainability? So at city, the work we have done is around building a framework which captures uh, a measurements as based on reflect and measures and reflects investors' perception of the firm's clean energy innovation profile. So we've come up with five criteria that we use when we talk to companies and we assess companies to see their path uh, towards green and how does that glide path look. So the five of them are, one is do companies communicate a clean strategy and a transition roadmap and strategy, which we can see from financial reports, from conversations with companies and so forth. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is, do they actually when they say they'll do it, do they really do that? And one way we look at that is, do they issue sustainability-linked bonds, not necessarily just for financing, but as a signaling and a commitment towards their goals? Thirdly, are companies building a supportive investor base and targeting ESG investors? We've clearly seen in the bond market, the profile of investors coming in today are very different, and ESG investors are out there looking for that investment. So are companies looking at that? Fourthly, are companies having, do they have a plan for re reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And if they have it, is it done with intensity? And lastly, and very importantly, and we see this a lot in the energy space, is are companies increasing the sale of revenue generation that's coming from renewables, and are they segregating the renewables business into a separate business and focusing on it? So these five are the glide paths we look at to see how companies are actually moving uh, towards ensuring they create a clean energy innovation profile. Um, I want to finally just touch on two quick, two quick bullets about City, and we've been asked this by investors in town halls um, and you know Q and A's. One of them is around you know does City approach the net zero? Uh, how does sorry how does City approach net zero, and what's our methodology? So in the bank, we follow a very much a credible science-based methodology that is informal, and we use very many frameworks that are out there to assess us. We've got goals internally to get to. 2050 net zero, but we've got a markers to achieve that at 2030 across different industries, so aluminum, agriculture, aviation, cement, and shipping. So that's how we are planning to get to our net zero commitments. And in terms of what we do in terms of priorities, the three priorities, which have a lot of initiatives and money attached to it, one of them is low carbon transition, climate risk, and sustainable operations. And this can all be read within the reports that we publish, and my colleagues will speak about that. So in conclusion, the hot topics in sustainability finance are complex and they're interconnected. While there are challenges to overcome, there are also opportunities to create a more sustainable future for all of us. As we work towards creating a more sustainable future, it's important to recognize that the role for corporations and financial institutions play in this fight is critical and vital. By prioritizing sustainable practices and investments, Businesses can only reduce their environmental footprint impact, but also contribute to economic growth and to social progress. And as we connect the dots between climate change, energy scarcity, and other global challenges, it's clear that the efforts are more important than ever. By embracing sustainability and taking a holistic approach, corporations can be part of the solution and the pressing problems. As a goal and as a bank, City is committed to playing a leading role in the transition to low carbon economy by promoting sustainable finance. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of advisory, a lot of transactions, and willing to support as economies and corporations transition. We believe that by working together, and hence this forum is so important, we can create a better future for generations to come. I want to end with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that my colleague shared with me at work that really stuck in my mind a few years ago, and I want to say, you know, say it back to you. Um, so Mahatma Gandhi once said, the world 
has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. So with that, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for hosting, and thank you for the panel. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Munir, for this amazing opening to the Banking Day. With a really good overview of not only the challenges going from global challenges to Europe and even all the way to what is happening and what is a, what's the scene and context in, the, in our central and European region. And also as actually in the spirit of this conference where we try to not only bring people together to speak and share best practices, share knowledge, but exactly as you pointed out, to actually showcase some of the amazing things that, that are happening, some of the examples and practical examples of companies and what you know, some of the success stories uh, of what is happening in the region. So thank you so much for that and for this very positive outlook and for kicking off the conference um, and the banking day. And now we will move to the second keynote by Mark Campanale, who is the, the founder and the executive director of Carbon Tracker Initiative, which are one of the leaders and pioneers when it comes to research on the impacts of climate risks on financial markets. So Mark, please, the floor is yours. You have the clicker. Thank you very much, and enjoy the keynote. Thank you for that introduction. Um, if you pause for a second and think for a minute, we're the first generation in human history that is able to heat, cook, power, and transport ourselves without having to set fire to anything. We can do everything today using electrons, electricity, and there is a battle between the molecule and the electron. Everything we've done in the past that's created the wealth we see today has been based on a fossil fuel system. What we're seeing being created around us today, right now is a revolution. It's a revolution that's moving from an old energy system to a completely new energy system, and one that doesn't require us to set fire to anything at all to heat homes and power ourselves. I couldn't help but just take this quote from one of my favorite films, The Matrix. Hopefully some of you will have seen The Matrix. Uh, Agent Smith, you hear that, Miss Anderson? That is the sound of inevitability. And it is inevitable that we'll come off the use of fossil fuels because the economics work, the technology works. We don't need any, any new breakthroughs for, the, for, 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 for power and for transport. Most of the technologies we need are with us now. It's just a matter of scaling. And that's really what I want to talk about in the few minutes I'm going to speak. And it really it's a point that's made by um, Vice President Al Gore a few years ago. Investors are waking up to the biggest investment opportunity in the history of the world. In economics, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen far faster than you thought that they could. I set up in, um, in the fund management industry some 33 years ago. My first job was a, as a green investment analyst. I did my first renewable energy deal in 1993. It was a geothermal energy company. And I did my first clean tech private equity deal in 1994. But it took another 20 years, really, before the world got to a point where these new technologies were able to compete with the old technologies. I set up Carbon Tracker a decade ago, and during that decade, what we have seen is the complete collapse in the costs of production of all the key new technologies, from wind, offshore wind, solar, uh, onshore wind, um, battery, battery storage. And you just here's some of the examples um, of some of those technologies. And it's really about learning curves. Um, coal, as a technology, the internal combustion engine hasn't really changed very much in the last 200 years. Uh, nuclear energy, though there's space for it, as a technology hasn't got cheaper the more that you build. All these other technologies which are being deployed at the moment uh, at scale have just got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. It's a bit like when you bought, perhaps when you bought your first mobile phone, people were paying 1,000 pounds Today, you can get your, your mobile phones very cheap. It's a bit the same like color TV. It's all about the deployment and the scaling of the technologies. Here's one that will surprise some of you. Um, last year in the UK, um, fossil energy was six times the cost of clean energy in the United Kingdom. And that really just reveals the competitive story. This is only going in one direction, ladies and gentlemen. And this is the, the surprise. This is the statistics from Ember. 
In last year, EU wind and solar generated more power than gas for the very first time. There's the wind and solar in green, there's the gas in the grey, and there's your drop down in, in coal um, as a proportion of all energy generated. And solar capacity is set to, to overtake all other power sources globally um, within the next few years. And in the United Kingdom, we've got enough renewable energy stacked up, being built today, needs to get connected to the grid that is multiple times more than the United Kingdom's energy needs. And that will make the United Kingdom a, a net energy exporter into, into Europe at current growth rates. So what this is all about is S-curves of growth driven by the energy transition and innovation as these costs have dropped by some 90% over the last two decades. So where, what did the analysts at Carbon Tracker, we're a non-profit think tank, there's about 50 of us between the US and the UK, what do we write about? We're looking at the potential for oil and gas demand destruction due to new EV uh, growth. About um, 20 million EVs on the road will probably kill about half a million to a million barrels of oil a day. Um, and this shows the rapid deployment, this is the United Kingdom, the country that's going at far faster rates than this is obviously China, and China will be a global exporter of EVs at prices well below existing prices for European manufacturers of cars with the internal combustion engine. Uh, it's, it's staggering to think it was just three, three years ago when EV sales as a proportion of all sales were negligible, now it's, it's hitting 20% 20, 20 of net new sales and growing up to 40, 50% elsewhere. Last year, another key milestone, a trillion dollars deployed into low carbon energy globally, um, electrified transport being the big one. And so demand is really d d d driving the supply equation. It's the new technologies on the demand side around electrification that is changing the way we supply energy. And, and for me, the key ones remain still solar and wind with battery storage for dispatchable power coming up quickly behind it. And this is exponential growth is all around us. It's not just in Europe, it's not just in a few isolated countries that we know about like Denmark, or as we heard just before, Poland. This is global. So in 90% of the world's economies, renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil energy. Why is this important for the banking system? If you look at the eight of the 10 largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, that create the liquidity that drives up asset prices, of course, they're all oil and gas based sovereign wealth funds, of which Norway is the largest. As the energy, fossil fuel energy system declines, we're gonna to have to start thinking about the liquidity that drives global asset prices where the sovereign wealth funds have been some of the biggest players uh, in markets. Have we seen this before? Of course we've seen this before. We've seen this in every technology that's come to find us, the mobile phone, the microwave, the, uh, the, um, the radio. You can just list them all, very similar S-curves of growth and adoption, and we've seen it in history through infrastructure systems on the right there from the deployment of canals, which then got replaced by the railroads, um, and then ultimately by mobile traffic we're seeing the same deployment. So what will this mean for people who bank the fossil fuel system? Um, we anticipate and are beginning to see a major drop. We're on the plateau before the end of the growth expectations, particularly for coal, which we know about, but also for gas and global oil demand. <laughs> gas use in Europe has dropped 20% in the last year because of the war in Ukraine. I believe that the new infrastructure that's being built around European gas is unneeded as we'll be adopting and moving to other technologies. So what do the fossil fuel companies think um, that are central to so many of the activities in capital markets and the debt markets to, 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 to lending to equity capital markets? They still believe that there's space for growth. Ultimately, I think that's probably going to be an error. And as we switch from the old system to the new system, we have to be mindful as investors. Are we going with companies in an undisciplined pursuit of more from the extraordinary hundreds of billions of dollars of excess profits we saw last year um, to one where inevitably that 
fossil-based system will be placed with a clean energy system? And are the management and the boards of these companies, are they really fit for the next stage, uh, for the next 10 years, as we move over to a cleaner energy system? I'll stop there. Those of you who don't know about Carbon Tracker, we work with pension funds and asset managers around the world, and all of our analysis is funded philanthropically. It's funded uh, by um, some very good people who allow us to do this research and analysis, and you can download it for free at carbontracker.org. And uh, I share this analysis as part of the advisory board of GFANS, the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero, um, and others working on this really important goal as we move to net zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you for setting this scene as well, and I think with both keynotes, I think the context and the scene has been set really well. And also, we have seen, again, some of, the, some of the challenges, some of the trends in the, when it comes to the transition to more sustainable, greener economy. And now, I think with the panel discussions, moving forward, we will probably go in much more detail. And um, so, I would like to now uh, kick off the first panel discussion of the day, and I will very kindly ask to the stage Eric Jones, director of Schumann Center from the European University Institute, who will be the moderator of the next panel discussion. Then Helena Horska, chief economist of Raiffeisen Bank, um, Professor Peter Bofinger, chair for monetary policy and international economics of the University of Würzburg, and also Miroslav Ployhar, strategist and senior economist of Česká spořitelna. Good. So the stage is yours, and over to you, Eric. No, super. I hope, um, I hope you guys can hear me okay. And I apologize in advance for my <coughs> Texas accent. I hope it doesn't create any confusion in, in terms of what I have to say. Um, I have to say that these two opening keynotes shocked me with a level of optimism. Um, and, 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 and particularly as I listened to, to Munir Nanji, um, describe the political stability in Central Europe as opposed to the geopolitical tension in Asia, I thought, wow, this is a level of optimism I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> um, and so, so I'm very happy to introduce a, a, a panel of economists uh, who will hopefully lower that optimism uh, down to something that's more comfortable uh, for somebody who spends a lot of his time studying political risk. Uh, and, and, and what we're going to do is introduce the conversation with three set-piece questions. I'm going to introduce the panelists in the order in which they're listed in the program and ask them a setup question to give them five to seven minutes to sort of set the stage from their perspective. And then hopefully I'm going to bring them into some kind of controversy that will depress you a little bit and, and encourage you to engage with us as well. Um, now, I'm going to start with Peter Bofinger from the University of Würzburg, and um, then I'll go to Helen, uh, Helena Horska from, from Raiffeisen uh, and Miroslav uh, Prohar from Česka Sportelina. Um, Peter, my question for you is, what are the great challenges facing the European banking system today? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, summit. And uh, I will talk mainly about the risk of uh, interest rate uh, transformation. And so when people talk about the situation in the banking system today, many ask, do we see a, a repetition of the financial crisis in 2007, 2008? Is it this kind of same story? But uh, one can say this time is different. In 2007, 2008, the problem was excessive lending, especially in the mortgage sector, which led to a boom in the real estate sector and then to a crash and which had created lots of problems uh, for the banking system, especially in the United States, but it was also transmitted via uh, uh, securitized uh, assets uh, to the European banking system. And one can say this is currently not, not the problem. We don't have a problem that we have uh, losses on, on the asset side of the balance sheet. The problem uh, today is maturity transformation. And why is the problem so severe? Well, we have observed a period of very, very low interest rates in a very long period of very low interest rates. And this is now followed, followed by a very abrupt and unprecedented increase in policy lending rates. And of course, this is a major challenge for the banking system because at the core of, uh, of banks is, is maturity transformation. And uh, uh, 
Therefore, banks now have two interrelated problems. First, on the asset side, they have lots of assets uh, which were acquired or bought in the period of very low interest rates and which have a relatively long maturity. For instance, in Germany, uh, banks have real estate loans to private households of about 1.6 trillion euros with an average uh, interest rate of 1.8% only. And they have, uh, they have loans to the corporate sector, again, most of them long term, uh, of 1.3 trillion euros with an average uh, interest rate of 2.5%. And the problems on the asset side are propagated by the very short term a maturity of the funding on the liability side. So again, let me, in Germany, banks have, um, t have, have side deposits of 2.9 billion trillion euro. So it's, you have this very long maturity with low interest rates on your, on your asset side, and you have this very uh, short uh, maturity uh, on, on your refinancing side. And of course, this, this creates problems for banks. And the question is, uh, is regulation really uh, well uh, equipped to deal with these challenges. And if you look at the Basel regulations um, and in, in, the, in Pillar 1, where you have to uh, provide capital for, for risk on a kind of standardized basis, uh, there is no need uh, to protect, to provide capital on this kind of regular basis on, on, on pillar, in Pillar 1. It's, it's only in Pillar 2 on a kind of discretionary basis. And, and the calculation for the so-called Basel coefficient are based on, on a, a kind of scenario of an upward or downward shift uh, of, of rates of uh, by 200 percentage points. And what we observe now is an, is an increase of, of 275 uh, basis points it was 200 basis points up and down, not 200 <laughs> percentage points, sorry. Uh, and, and now what, what we observe now is, <coughs> in, 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 the, in the case of the ECB, that, uh, the, sh that uh, the policy rates have been increased by 375 uh, basis points. And of course, the question is, is, is regulation, has, has it been able to deal with these problems in an adequate way? Munir was quite optimistic that, that, that it did, but nobody really knows. And, uh, and uh, therefore, um, we, we, we know that, that banks have been using uh, interest rate swaps to shift the, in, the, the interest rate risks to pension funds and uh, to, to the insurance sector, but we don't know whether it has been really sufficient. I think that's, that's a risk that's, that's looming, but nobody really knows it. Um, the related question is whether we are now facing another doom loop, as we observed it in the years 2010, 2012 in the euro area, and which was a major contribution to the euro crisis. Um, what was this doom loop about? Well, uh, in 2010, market participants realized the increase in, in government debt and the, 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 the threat of government debt in, in the euro area. As a result, risk premia went up and higher risk premia, of course, uh, had an effect on the banks who were large, who were, had lots of government bonds in their portfolios. The governments had to, had to save the banks, which increased government debt and increased government debt led to an increase of risk premia. So it was a kind of doom loop. Uh, and I would say today the situation is better, so some optimism may, might, be, <laughs> might be there, because the ECB had been quite clever in protecting uh, the, ba the, the banking systems against this kind of doom loop with this transmission protection instrument. And the transmission protection instrument is designed in a way that the increase in policy rates which is inevitable, does not lead to an increase in spreads. And so far, the ECB has been quite successful in dealing uh, with, with this problem. We haven't seen an, 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 we haven't seen an unusual increase in, in uh, risk premium. But nevertheless, uh, one has to be aware that the European banks have increased their bond portfolios quite considerably uh, during the COVID phase. So they've sold large amounts of, of government bonds, so there's still some, some risk uh, in, in, this, in, in the banks. So overall, if you, if you look at the, at the European banking system, it looks like a forest with an increased uh, risk of, uh, of, 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 of fires. And if, if in, in this situation, it's really important to have an effective fire brigade to prevent that local fire spread to the whole forest. And if you look at this metaphor, uh, and, and you look at what's happening, what was happening in, in Switzerland with Credit Suisse, you can say, well, the Swiss fire brigade wasn't, wasn't very effective um, because in its financial stability report uh, in, in September 2022, uh, the Swiss National Bank um, 
uh, uh, tested to Credit Suisse in, in capital, uh, uh, capital, capital position which was above average. And they also said uh, the Credit Suisse is quite resilient as far as shocks are concerned. So there was a very positive assessment. And by the end of 2022, Credit Suisse had, had an equity of about 43 uh, uh, billion Swiss francs. And, and even only a few days before the, the failure of Credit Suisse, uh, uh, Swiss National Bank said Credit Suisse is a solvent bank, but they did not, uh, did, they were unable to, 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 were not willing to save Credit Suisse. And I think this is something which is not in the, in the textbook uh, of, of what central banks have to do, because the normal uh, procedure is if a bank is sol solvent but illiquid, it's the task of the central bank to rescue this, this bank. And, and I, I don't know why, why, why Swiss National Bank was not willing to do that. And I think that's a bad signal in, in a situation where you have increased risk of, of fire if, if an important central bank is not willing to fulfill this task, which is, which is normally its, its ordinary task. And therefore, it's really important that the central banks make clear their commitment that if banks have a liquidity problem, and this is something that can happen every day, we never know which bank it is, but if the bank is solvent, it will be, it will be saved at 100%. I think that's, this commitment is really required, and I was a little bit scared to read uh, in Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung that the, the German central bank president was said, said, we are not the fire brigade for the, for the financial system, but if the central bank is not the fire brigade, who else will, will provide uh, fires in, in the banking system? So I think here is a risk that should, should be, that, that one must see, and I hope that central banks will be more uh, determined to, to fulfill their, their function as, as, a, as a fire brigade. And of course, uh, governments also can contribute to more stability uh, in the banking system by increasing uh, the amounts that are protected under the deposit insurance scheme. I think some people ask for that in the United States, and I think by this, doing this, also governments can help to keep, uh, to prevent uh, forest fires in, in the banking system. Okay, thank you very much. Peter, I feel so much better having heard you talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess the, 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 the point of tension in what you say, though, that it will come back to later, is between the idea that there are key members of the governing council on the ECB that don't believe they should be the fire brigade uh, and the confidence that you have in the TPI, the transmission protection instrument, because that, um, that, that may be confidence that, that we don't want to test uh, in, in any real world experiment. Having said that, you know, I guess, I, I guess the question that you point to in the context of this maturity uh, transformation problem is how resilient our underlying macroeconomic performance is. I mean, are we going to be able to grow out of this and, and correct this inflation problem? So, Helena, I'm going to turn to you on that. What do you, what do you think is the macroeconomic outlook um, for the Czech Republic, for the region, uh, and for the euro area as a whole? Yeah. Thank you for the question, and thank you for having me, uh, having me here. I like uh, the positive view and opportunity as uh, Murin uh, mentioned before. Uh, definitely I like it, but I see more challenges, uh, but also some opportunities, definitely. But in the case of macroeconomic development, not only in the Czech Republic, but also in the region, is the question of the model of the future growth, because all our C economies were based on, as you mentioned, FDIs. Question is, if there will come uh, also in the future, uh, if we will be able to cope with uh, rising, let's say, energy costs, with lack of labor in the uh, Czech Republic, not only in Czech Republic, uh, with other challenges regarding the change in the supply chains. We see the return uh, from uh, China to Europe and see that uh, some part of our economy, especially automotive sector, is really uh, challenging uh, with the import or is challenging with the import from uh, China. Uh, so, yeah, we need to uh, find new growth model in the Czech Republic and in the C region. We also need to uh, focus on our shortages, including labor markets. And now we see the period of very high inflation. So it means uh, the very fast growth in living costs. 
some part of this, it's definitely the convergence of our price and living standard and living cost to vast uh, uh, part of uh, Europe. But some part of it, it's also based or its uh, impact of maybe not not very smart economic policies of the governments. I'm speaking about the Czech Republic. I'm <laughs> speaking about also the Hungary and other countries because the COVID, uh, uh, I would say, helicopter money, uh, as I can see in Czech Republic, was at least one third of the problem with high inflation in Czech Republic. So definitely I uh, see lots of challenges, but. I share the optimism because I definitely uh, see the pressure from business side, uh, the pressure from the government uh, to move on and to change the situation and to keep the Czech economy and sea region to grow. And the banker system uh, has a very important and key role in uh, this, uh, would say, transition. Because in my view, we are facing the new kind of transition uh, just now, because we went through, like, I would say, perfect storm, COVID shock, then energy shock, and finally the war shock. And all these shocks, as I mentioned, perfect storm, just show what uh, we need to change. And this is uh, the, uh, the model of the growth. This is the lack of labor force. This is uh, modernization of our education. This is also the risk of a very fast increase in public debt. But what is also positive, and I would compare the banking sec uh, sector in Germany, in the US, with the Czech uh, banking system, because even in the, in the uh, period of global financial crisis, the banking sector was strong, was safe, and was stable. And even now, we have even higher uh, deposits to loan ratio. So we have more deposits than loans. So thought we are still credit uh, uh, market, still like premature. Uh, we, thanks to conservativeness of our households and conservativeness of, of our companies, very high share of uh, savings. The savings rate, by the way, in the Czech Republic is more than 20% of a disposable income. And in Czech economy, we have roughly 5% to GDP over savings from the uh, COVID times. So our companies are conservative, financial conservative. Our households are financial conservative. And this is also things that can help to stabilize or it making uh, the base for the banking and financial sector very tough and strong. Regarding uh, the uh, challenges, one of the things as a macroeconomist I'm thinking about is the change of uh, the normality. What is normal? Was normal the very low interest rates uh, uh, before or ahead of the shocks? Almost uh, zero rates in EU, even negative rates in the case of Eurozone, and very low inflation. Was this the normal, or we are approaching the new normal, not with in this double-digit inflation and very high interest rates, but the new, no a new normal uh, in which uh, the inflation will be single-digit, will be close to, I hope, to central bank inflation targets, the interest rates, will reflect the situation in economy, will be not negative, but, but positive. There would be no pressure to build up an, uh, another uh, bubbles or high increase in uh, uh, sectors like household, or, 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 sorry, housing prices, or the debt increase and very low interest rates uh, of the government and also uh, companies' debt. So I hope in the new future, in the new normal, uh, in which we will see more balanced economic growth, and I wish for Czech Republic even faster economic growth, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to wish for that. So, <clears throat> Helena, that, that, was, that was really fascinating, and I'm, I, I guess there is a point of tension, though, in the sense that when you talk about the high level of savings in the Czech Republic, 
Um, it does make me wonder if, together with the helicopter money that you alluded to, the Czech Republic is going to have a hard time controlling domestic demand, right? Because the money is already in the pockets uh, of households. So we may have to come back to that uh, at, at some point in the future. Um, as, uh, before we do, though, Miroslava, I'm, I'm, I want to bring you in to ask you what you think about our ability to manage risks within the banking system, the, the risks associated with the maturity transformation that Peter raised, the risks associated with the exogenous shocks that Helena raised, um, and, and, and also risks that are associated with this huge transformation that's underway. I was struck when Mark Campanella put up the slide of the S-curve transformation from infrastructures, the canal system and the railroad system. In the middle of those S-curves was 1835 and 1891, which were big financial crises in the United States associated with both of those innovations. So, so are we ready to deal with that? I mean, um, can you give us a sense of how prepared the banking system is in that context? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, small disclaimer, I'm in bank, I'm paid for to be a pessimist. Yeah, and to look at because I'm looking all the time at financial risk, uh, fixed risk, interest rate risk. So, so maybe I, I may sound a bit pessimistic, but uh, as a person, I'm optimist one, of course. So, so uh, I must agree with what Peter told about uh, about uh, I, I call it the duration risk rather than transformation risk. And I would wish a lot that uh, there are no, no there can be no problem as what happened in the United States, like Silicon Valley Bank and so on. Unfortunately, what I see from interest rate risk point of view, uh, we got similar symptoms here. I, I don't know. I don't want to uh, tell, talk about any particular bank, but but uh, when you got uh, higher higher rates on deposits. You're paying on short term, short term of the curve, and and you get a lot of assets, uh, long term assets uh, that simply hard to hard to hard to survive. Yeah, and uh, the case is that uh, that is that is non-linear. When uh, when rates go up about two percentage points, nobody cares about what what the deposit rate is because that, that's the one of uh, one of important thing in in Europe, especially eurozone, and even that was the case in Czech Republic. That when the rates are relatively low, no one pays uh, attention whether the deposit rate is zero or, or something. When it goes up and up, more and more people are trying to get deposit uh, higher rates, mm. and it is nonlinear. It's really changing, changing, and that is what we, uh, what we saw here in Czech Republic when rates were 2%, nobody pays attention. When currently rates are more, almost one year 7%, everybody is trying to get 6% on deposit. Sure. And when you get, uh, when you get a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, assets on, on fixed rate, Imagine, for example, just in, uh, just in numbers, when you got Boons and bought it two years ago, the, the Boon price is down 20%, which is quite hard to, high, quite hard to, to manage. So uh, coming back, how to manage it? I think uh, banks, and, and mo most of banks are doing it, trying to solve it earlier than, than depositors find out there's a problem. For example, what was Silicon Valley Bank when Peter Thiel came, oh, this bank is basically bankrupt and cost, cost bankrupt and what was, was bankrupt. So, so that's the first case. And, and second, maybe, maybe related to interest rate risk, I have to, I have to mention uh, whether, whether it is, it is long -term, longer term story, the inflation or not. Uh, one, of, one of the guys who uh, is the clear winner of, of this interest rate, interest rate mismatch are governments issuing a lot of bonds at low prices. Unfortunately, the, the, the cost must be paid by someone partially by banks, partially by insurance company, pension funds, but mostly by central banks, who hold the most of, biggest chunk of, of bonds in their portfolio, and who are taking slow losses. They are, of course, much, much bigger capacity to take loss than, than normal, normal banks. But it is creating, that is like going back into fiscal policy and creating money again. Uh, to, to, sum, to, to close it, this, uh, I think, being on optimistic note, I think the, it's still time for not just for banks but for corporates to, to, to get ready, even at higher rates. Because, uh, for example, in euros, uh, central bank, European central bank is going up, but but you can you can fix your your long term your term liabilities at three percent, which is which is still good, being being on positive note. But but if I understand what you just said, Miroslav, and I I, I, I want to make sure I get this point correctly. What you're arguing is that in contrast to what, what Peter was suggesting, the central banks are already being the fire brigade. They're already absorbing a huge amount of the risk that's in the system. Did I get that right? 
yeah, they are absorbing, but, but they are creating uh, loss. Yeah, and so, 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 some, some banks, some central banks are showing the loss. As for example, uh, Czech Central, central Bank, Bank or, or Swiss Central Bank. Some are, are there is no mark to market for the Zarmper Fed. And, uh, but, but at the end, uh, that, is a, that is about this transformation, but the loss is taken. Yeah? And imagine, for example, for some central banks that, that uh, their assets are going down by 50%, which can happen. Yeah? And then you got smaller assets, higher, higher liabilities. So that's, uh, that's kind of fiscal, quasi-fiscal policy. Okay, but they're not, they're not just taking a loss on their assets. I mean, Helen, if I understood you correctly, they're also taking a loss on their liabilities, right? Because there's all these reserves in the banking system that they have to pay out at ever-increasing deposit rates. Did I get that right? So we've got losses on both sides of the portfolio of the central bank. Yeah, definitely. And this is also expansionary. So if we are speaking about the price stability and financial stability, we, uh, the central bank, not we, the central bank needs to tackle that. And the risk is that if they would like to reduce their uh, portfolios, uh, they will at least uh, officially and, and financially realize the, the, the loss uh, from the change of the price. So this is, uh, in my view, the challenges that the central bank uh, uh, like face now, because uh, as I mentioned, like in the uh, previous period, uh, we uh, see not only very low interest rates or negative interest in the case of uh, Eurozone, but a very huge, very huge uh, increase of uh, the balance sheet of the central banks. And the question is if they will be really able without the very hard impact of the market and hard impact on the banking system and banking uh, stability to reduce the balance sheet. And in my uh, view, it's maybe the biggest challenge for the cent big central banker uh, and central banks uh, than rising or reducing the interest rates of the, uh, in the future. So I think definitely, like in the Czech Nation Bank, we see the, uh, the uh, balance sheet uh, close to 60% of GDP. And it's gradually reducing. But, but why? Because uh, the vo uh, revaluation of the, of the central bank balance sheet is caused by uh, corona appreciation and then also the reduction of the prices of uh, uh, assets, bonds and equities. But, but Peter, this gets back to the point that you were making about, uh, about Nagel, right? I mean, because the, the Bundesbank in particular, but all the central banks in the Eurozone must be coming under intense pressure because they face imminent losses, because they have this requirement to reduce the balance sheet. So for them, the, the, the idea of, of being the lender of last resort must seem incredibly unattractive because it would create, and this is a, a, a question that comes um, from Castutus, uh, Kupsis, um, it, it creates conditions of moral hazard. Um, and, and, and I guess, so my question for you is, have we put our central banks, by, by allowing them to get so overextended, have we put them in a situation where politically it's very hard for them to do what institutionally they're supposed to do, be the lender of last resort in case of financial crisis? Uh, there are two points. First, the lender of last resort function, there's no alternative to it. Uh, so whatever... Uh, problems central banks might have, refusing to act as a lender of last resort uh, would be a disaster. I think that's because then you really have a fire spreading over the whole financial system, uh, and I think there, there's no alternative to this. The second question is uh, what about the profitability of central banks, so to say? And yes, um, it's true that central banks somehow stabilize the financial system because they are, remun they are paying relatively high interest rates on the deposits held by commercial banks with the central bank. So that's somehow, a st and, and of course the deposit rate that the ECB is paying to banks is much higher than the rate on deposits held with commercial banks so far. And so that's of course something that stabilizes the profitability um, of commercial banks, but overall, um, even if, if central banks have a negative equity, that's not a problem. I think that's something one has to communicate to the public. Uh, a central bank is a different animal than a commercial bank, because a central bank has no convertibility for, for, for the deposits held with it, while a commercial bank 
promises convertibility of commercial bank deposits into central bank money. And so it's a completely different animal, and I think it might be difficult to communicate it to the public, but I think it will be inevitable that there will be losses by, mm -hmm. by central banks, but that's not, not an economic problem. The problem can be from the financial market. If they were reduced to too fast or no, no that's true so if okay so, so about so the reduction of the balance sheet because uh, this is the risk uh, that i'm uh, seeing now that's of course that's another question how f <laughs> how fast do we reduce yeah. uh, the bond holdings of, of of the central banks and i but i assume that the ecb will do it in a moderate and gradual way and will not contribute with this reduction of its of its bond holdings to, to very to, to additional increases in, in long-term rates, and, and so far, I think you, mm -hmm. you said it, we can say that the long-term uh, interest rates uh, on, on government bonds are still relatively moderate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so for the, and if I may add, for the countries that are still outside the Eurozone, uh, the negative equity of the central bank is also the risk for the euro adoption in the future, because then can be the requirement from uh, European institution to, okay. as was in the case of Slovak uh, right. Central Bank and Slovak country, uh, to balance uh, the negative equity okay. of the Central Bank. So, if we are speaking out of the Eurozone, okay. we point. as a Czech Republic, as a country that should somewhere in the future, we don't know when, uh, <laughs> adopt the Euro, we definitely should also look at the negative equity of the Central Bank because it's one of the obstacles and okay. one of the risks of the future Euro adoption. Good point, yeah. To put yeah, uh, all yeah, the yeah, risk true, yeah. uh, together, because yeah. this is another point from the block of the Eurozone yeah. countries and outside the Eurozone mm -hmm. or, or outside the US. Yeah. But, but, but here, I guess, I would, I, I would raise a big question mark about the, the reasonableness of the pace of running off the ECB's balance sheets, because the Euro system is about to release $477 billion, uh, in collateral back onto the market when the tell is mature. Uh, at the end of June, which happens to coincide almost precisely with the peak of tension around the debt ceiling debate in the United States. Do you think, Miroslav, if I can bring you into this conversation, that the sudden <laughs> withdrawal of all of that liquidity is going to create problems in the financial system, or is this something that the banks will be able to manage easily? Uh, would create a prob problem. Uh, why, why I started with this, uh, with this central bank balance sheet and so on is not about criticizing central banks or so on. It's about implication for, for, for normal guys, normal, normal companies thinking about, about ESG investment and so on. Does it mean that the, these problems create long ter longer term inflationary environment or low inflationary environment? I think these, all these problems, it can happen with banks when you hike the rates, short term rates too fast relatively, relatively to, to long, -term, long term curve. Is that you are enabled, you are, the central bankers are not able to go high enough. So, uh, so that is creating kind of a, a stop and go policy we heard from textbooks from, I don't know, a long time ago, 70s. Uh, we're thinking why they really did in the 70s, like this stop and go policy. And thinking about it, well, uh, they, they didn't see it, what, what's wrong. They probably try, try to hike it. And then again, see that something's w so wrong happening, cutting again. And that is exactly what the markets are pricing right now. Like the, the, the rates in the US, in, in, in Eurozone, and even in Czech Republic will go down sharply because there will be some, some problems, some recession, and so on. But I think that is a process that central banks cannot really withdraw enough liquidity, cannot really hike the rates high enough because it's, uh, because, they are, uh, because their actions are causing problems, they have to go back down, probably, to go again up. It's just like going to the mountains, you go to the base camp, then trying one, one uh, move up, go to for adaptation, go back and go up again, and, and it is process. So Peter, I, 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 I take Miroslav's point very seriously. Do you think that there is a danger right now that we have been begun moderating the pace of of uh, monetary tightening in the eurozone prematurely and that we're going to find ourselves in a stop-go cycle as a consequence as we battle against the inflation that's being created? No, I, I don't see that problem. I see the problem a little bit that the ECB started to hike rates relatively late. And I think they should have started, I would say, three or four months earlier. Uh, and now I think the risk is that they are t hiking, uh, that they, they, they stop hiking also too late. And so if you listen to what central bankers say uh, nowadays, they say, well, 
we don't see that uh, core inflation is coming down. That's why we have to continue hiking rates. But as we know from all textbooks, the transmission legs of monetary policy are long. Uh, one year, 18 months, or even more. So if you, if, you, if you take the actual development of the core inflation as the guide, uh, guidepost for your interest rate policy, it's definitely wrong. So I, I, I think th there I see the risk if you listen to, to central bankers, they say, oh, well, so far, uh, is the core inflation still increasing or not, not declining? So we have to go on tightening. I think that's definitely wrong. And so I, my fear is that the ECB will also be too late in, 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 uh, in, the stop, in stopping the interest rate hikes. Now, if you're right about that, Helena, I need to bring you in on this. I mean, you know, what is going to be the impact on bank lending, particularly bank lending for these huge infrastructure investment projects that need to be undertaken? Because if they get it wrong, and, and, and we know from the most recent bank lending survey that, that credit conditions have been tightening because of the withdrawal of liquidity and the end of the Teltros, but they're also tightening now increasingly because of the impact of monetary policy. If they get this wrong, are we going to get the investments that we need in order to have the kind of transition that Mark and, 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 um, and Munir described earlier? Yeah, so it's a very interesting question because, yeah, but uh, the intention of uh, rising interest rates is definitely reducing the credit issue and the credit cycle. Yeah, so this is the impact. The and the question is if we need to move on and in, uh, invest to uh, future, invest into infrastructure, new technologies, uh, we definitely uh, have a would say lower opportunities because the number of uh, uh, plans or num number of uh, investment projects that will be able to be uh, like profitable with the higher interest rates is definitely smaller. So, of course, it will reduce the opportunities for investment from the f uh, fiscal point of view. But on the other side, you have the government policies that are not only supporting ESG, because we are in the GSG summit, we should speak about a little bit about the ESG as well. Uh, and we also, as the government is doing, is invest to still physical infrastructure, like in sea region, you, you still need a very high demand and high increase in physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, uh, human. This is also investment into human quality. So I think uh, the government in this has also the positive role to uh, at least rebalance the maybe the negative impact of high interest rates on investment activity. But me as an economist, I definitely expect relatively lower investment activity in the CA region because of higher interest rates. But I think this is that we need to do definitely because of uh, price stability, because from for investment project, the price instability and higher double-digit inflation is even worse evil than higher interest rates. So the first thing is to stabilize the price development, and then we can speak about if the rates should be a bit lower or a bit higher, but the first thing is to really uh, stabilize the price development. Peter. Well, I think one should not overestimate the effect of short-term rates now on longer-term <laughs> investment projects. And uh, still, as I said, the long-term government bond rates are still relatively low. So in Germany, we have 2% and something for 10-year government bo uh, bonds. And with an inflation rate of 2%, assuming it's, it's still close to zero, the real rate. In, in, the, in the average of the euro area, it's maybe 1% real rate, so it's not that high. But I think you made a very important point. As far as investment in, in uh, renewables and, and the whole renewable ecosystem is concerned, I think the government has to play a decisive role. And if you look at the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of investment now going on. Uh, even with higher uh, interest rates than the euro area. And what I see as a major problem uh, for, 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 for the business model of Germany, but also the euro area uh, and, 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 and the European Union in, in general, is that we don't have the same, uh, same incentives provided for, for investments like the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think that's, that's the greatest challenge, that we, some, somehow the Commission is, is trying to become a little bit more generous, but overall, um, uh, we are not able to match the conditions that the Invest Inflation Reduction Act offers to investors in the United States. And, and you can see 
for, for the, once the government incentives are strong, interest rates are only of secondary importance. And I think here we have a huge, huge gap, and I hope that sooner or later, that especially also in Germany, uh, politicians will realize that subsidies are inevitable if you want to, want to have a, a business model uh, which, which is based on renewables and all, everything that is related to that. If I may add to this, because this was a great point about the long interest rates. And in this sense, I think it's very important to important to have a very, I would say, sustainable fiscal policy. And this is another challenge for uh, Europe and also Czech Republic in the uh, CEA region, because otherwise, uh, if uh, the market will see the risk of a very fast rising public debt and huge uh, fiscal imbalance, the long interest rate will go up. So at the same time, uh, the fiscal policy should definitely support the long investment project, but uh, needs to reduce the fiscal imbalances. Otherwise, we will see another increase in long interest rates. May I contradict a little bit? <laughs> if you look at the United States, they have huge fiscal deficits and the government debt is increasing, and hopefully if, if it's not stopped. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I'm optimist, but I'm optimistic in this regard, but, but if you look at, at what the United States do not care about, uh, about fiscal Italy, deficits, Italy, and, and, and it's, it's, it's successful in, attractive, in, a, in, attract, in attracting uh, companies. And if we have fiscal, like, like most of my German compatriots like it, if you have a bal balanced, uh, <laughs> a balanced budget, uh, but nobody is investing in the long term, this is not a good idea. So Miroslav, I need to bring you in at this point because so far, so far Peter has been advocating for a lender of last resort and a spender of last resort. Um, but, but, um, but what, I'm, um, what I guess I'm curious about is, let's not forget, Munir started off his presentation by talking about the fact that the weighted cost of capital, you know, weighted average cost of capital is actually higher than the return on investment in these projects. I mean, is that what you're seeing in the market? That, that, that what we have in our business sector are a bunch of people servicing debts rather than making profitable investments? And if that's the case, how do we get that fixed unless we appeal to what Peter is offering, the spender of last resort model where the state steps in and, and covers the gap? I have to say with longer time rates where they are right now, I think uh, the shift from low, very low interest rate environment to higher interest rate environment was so, 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 so quick that uh, Almost everybody, I think even, of course, even me, we are still thinking in the previous environment. But the environment has clearly changed, and that there's a risk that it will change even more. So, so current rates are not that bad because, because we must take into account development in, possible development into, in the future. It's, I, I wish a lot that central banks would not be as, as, a, as a expansionary, that fiscal policies would not be at that big deficit. But, I am personally, I am a stoic, so I think that that is happening. I have no power to, to influence it. Of course, uh, Helena I can influence it a bit, or Peter, but, but as, a, as, a, as a guy on the market, <laughs> I'm not no. able to influence it. I must simply take it as, a, as it is and, and try, to, try, try to live in it. So, so currently, current rates maybe look high, higher relative to, relative to uh, return on investment, but return on investment in, in what inflationary terms? If in higher inflation, then uh, the return on investment will be definitely higher than, than currently projected. Well, I think, I, I think Miroslav, most macroeconomic policymakers would say they're actually trying to influence you, and they're not, <laughs> they're not succeeding in influencing the market in a way that's predictable. And, and, and partly, I think that comes from the fact that as we move toward this sustainable finance model, we're confronting the reality that we don't have viable macroeconomic models on which we can all agree, right? Um, and, and so my, uh, my question, and I'm going to start with you, Peter, and then, then go to you, Helena. My question is, is you know, what are the core macroeconomic principles that we should all agree on? Because it doesn't seem to me, even as I look at the governing council of the ECB, that, that there are very many of those that are the subject of positive agreement at the moment. Well, of course, we need price stability. I think that's undoubted. I'm relatively uh, confident that we will get inflation rates down. If you look at uh, changes uh, uh, of inflation on a month-to-month -month basis, you can already see that the momentum is, is declining. So I, I, but I think that's obvious. Um, I'm not so sure whether we need balanced budgets, um, as, as the example of, of Japan shows, but also of the United States. If you are a large currency area, there are no financial constraints for governments. The only 
constraint is a real constraint. And of course, you have to be careful as a government um, to, to look at this real constraint. For instance, in the United States, the very generous transfers made by Trump and Biden to households, uh, they violated the real constraint and inflation went up. Uh, but, but so I think this is something you have to have, to have in mind. But uh, I, as, I, I think uh, but what is really uh, the first of the first importance is really to to support this transition to renewables with all financial means because in the long run that will also save a lot of money so so i'm 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 surprised that one of the things that you did not bring in as a core principle that we should all agree on is is this too big to fail aspect or or, or the bailout of sovereign uh, solvent institutions aspect I mean, there's no, no, a, of course that, that of course, don't. <clears throat> there's a, there's an excellent new book out that looks at the origins mm -hmm. of modern financial capitalism uh, in the decision actually to begin bailing out institutions at the end of the 17th beginning of the 18th centuries without which we wouldn't get the kind of risk management that we see out of the banking system because it would just be too conservative. Um, but, but Helena, would you, would you agree with these core principles or add to any of them? Yeah, uh, definitely I would agree with price stability because I already mentioned it. But uh, the, uh, as the first word that I was, you, uh, uh, would use is sustainability. And sustainability in many aspects. This is regarding the price stability. It's about sustainability of the price growth. Sustainability. If you look on the labor market, this is the long-term uh, long problem of aging population. So we have the demographic trend uh, through which we go, uh, need to go through it. Then sustainability regarding fiscal dominance. That this is I'm like uh, really speaking about because because it's not really a question if the fiscal budget is uh, balanced. In my view, is the question that the fiscal situation should not limit the economic growth, should even support it. The fiscal dominance means that the, the fiscal policy uh, has implication for monetary policy. So. Central bank needs to think about the interest rates uh, hikes and impact on uh, the uh, budget deficit uh, on the on the on the debt payment, and this is wrong. So the fiscal dominance should be also tackled. So I'm not like see, uh, thinking we should have in any time balanced budget. I'm thinking the balanced budget or the budget needs to be flexible. At the bad time, at the time of crisis and shock, the, uh, the fiscal policy needs to be flexible to react. And on the other side, at the good time, they need to make the reserves. And in this case, I think the German uh, economy and German government is a nice example because ahead of COVID, they did some reserves and they used them during the COVID shock. While in Czech Republic, we uh, haven't, or we did not have any reserves. And what we did, we uh, increased the public debt and deficit, uh, in my view, too much. So sustainability. And then we also can speak about the sustainable economic growth. So the question is not about fast grower, and, uh, so grow faster and faster, but to grow to leave the sources for another generation. So, uh, in my view, I would use in a macroeconomic policy the new term, and we should, in macroeconomic policy, focus on long-term sustainability in many aspects. But, but I guess my concern is that, that you know, these principles that you're talking about, we're not actually seeing. And the more that we advocate these principles, Miroslav, the more market participants must experience a kind of cognitive dissonance. And they get into that Peter Thiel moment where they WhatsApp all of their client companies and provoke a run on the bank on which they're all dependent, right? So, so to what extent are we in a situation where market participants could actually, in a rational way, do terrible harm to our financial and real economies? Well, I don't, I don't want to sound alarmistic, but uh, you know, from the market, what I see, for example, uh, there's a smoke definitely in Europe as well. For example, some banks are, are taking euro deposits at 3.5% above ECB. So that, is, that means that they are desperate for money. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the problem is here. And, and maybe, maybe coming back to your question about, about fiscal, about, about, uh, about, uh, lender, about uh, whether central banks should, should support, support uh, governments and on large, large bailout and so on. They, are, they, they did it, basically. 
in, in some extent. Yeah, and 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 one one last one last issue here uh, regarding to what what should be done in policy and what is the assumption, what is the wishes I would like to see as an economist that government and central bank should do, and what is the assumption about what what I like what I should do as a, as an investor and as an assumption I would say do not mix assumptions and wishes as as James Bond told shaken not stirred yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, from the point of view of, of what, what's going on, I see environment and inflationary and in accelerating inflationary, even though short-term outlook is much better. In Czech Republic, in Germany, in Eurozone, given decline in energy prices and so on, long-term, I think we are building inflationary environment. And the reasons are all, uh, are all we uh, talk about today. Take it to the, to the, to the one, one, uh, one pot and say, is it inflationary or not? and decide what to do with your financing of your uh, long-term projects. So <clears throat> I guess one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this conversation, I want to thank all three of you for engaging with it, is that we have really covered a whole range of issues <laughs> associated with economic policymaking and its impact on the financial system. Um, the last thought I would leave you with, though, is that what about the impact of other policies that are being made right now. And I'm struck here by a recent speech that was delivered by Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor in the United States, uh, who argued at the Brookings Institution last April um, that, that foreign policy in the United States should be made with, without looking at market rationality and should be focused much more on strategic considerations. The IRA uh, is one illustration of that. But the heavy use of sanctions, not just against Russia, but also against China, is another, and the extent to which that could provoke decoupling of this global economy is quite important, I think, in the way it would impact not just on, on Europe uh, and on Germany, but on the Czech Republic by dint of the implications for the whole economic model that Europe has succeeded in creating, a model that depends critically on globalization. Um, I, I realize I've used up all of our time without giving you, the audience, an opportunity to ask questions. I apologize for that, but I hope you found it to be an engaging conversation. Please join me in thanking my panelists uh, for their participation. I really found it very useful to hear what they had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I completely agree, Eric. That was a, and I think hopefully all of you agree, a very strong panel, but also really strong first section of the day um, and really good kickstart to the even more discussions on banking and sustainability in banking. So I thank all the speakers and the moderator for the amazing discussion. And now we will have a 30 minute coffee break. So I invite you all to get some coffee and refreshments and people online. Hopefully you can also get some coffee where you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>